of the origins of this kingdom scheme. Next, we will touch upon both the connection between the King Kings and Cross and the King Kings as an independent composition. And finally, I will conclude with the meaning and significance of King Kings in early medieval period. Um, and I feel oh, that already in the beginning of my presentation, I use the word King Kings too many times, and I hope I won't annoy you too much with this word uh, in the time that I have. So, as we all know, the cross pattern, uh, although its history is much more ancient, became ubiquitous in the Middle Ages as a Christian sign with multivariate meanings. It signified Christ's death and resurrection. It had eschatological connotations. It had, according to Beatrice Kitzinger, the present register in which the function and the materiality of cross were revealing themselves. But also, a cross is a scheme. A cross is a composition. And today I'm going to be referring primarily to this aspect of the cross. And this dimension of the cross is particularly evident in monumental decorations and book illuminations. So cross might be an object as we've just seen on the previous slide. But here, cross serves as organizing power, and it can be shown first in the mosaic from Jordan with inscriptions in Greek written inside the ornament organized in the form of a cross. Second, in the Carolingian scientific diagram that you can see in the center of the screen, where winds organized in a way to leave the space for the cross sign in the middle, Marked, marked by green, yellow, and brown colors. Mm. Here, the cross is not decorative or ornamental. The inclusion of a cross changes the usual number of wings represented on such diagrams, as argued by Bianca Kuchner. And third, we can see this uh, compositional power of a cross in Atonian Uta Codex, where the elements surrounding the head of God form the cross. In all of these instances, cross serves as organizing power, compositional power. However, what interests me the most about these examples is that apart from crosses, the images contain another composition. And this composition is called kinkans. In the mosaic from Jordan, the kinkans is formed by ornamental ovals. In the diagram, by four small circles with lunar phases in the outer codex by four personifications in the corners of the folio. So what is the King Kongs? It is a five medallion structure with one medallion at the center and four additional medallions on its four sides. One may find this structure very, very familiar because it is a pattern that could be recognized on a dice, but it might be even more familiar for those who study medieval art because it constitutes one of the main medieval iconographies, namely Maestro's Domini or Christ in Majesty with four evangelists. And my questions to this composition are where it originated, how exactly it is connected to the cross pattern, because obviously they do have visual connection, visual similarity. And at the same time, to what extent this composition might be considered independent from the cross pattern? Uh, let's first talk about the origins of the kinkas. The word itself comes from Latin, and initially it was applied not to the pattern of five medallions, but to the number. Kinkas means five twelfths. The word was used in the name of the bronze Roman coin issued at the end of the third century BC with the value of five twelfths of an ass. On this coin, we can see the earliest connection between the word kinkans, which was used in the name of the coin, and the pattern of five dots organized in a checkered order, uh, which was used in the design of this coin, as you can see on the slide. Another evidence of association between the Narva King Kings and the Patan King Kings come from the, comes from the texts of 
Barbara, Colonella, Cicero, and Quintilian, who wrote about a specific disposition of trees that you can see now on the screen. They are organized in a checkered order as well, and this order of trees is also called quincunx. Notably, both Cicero and Cotillian describe the plantation of trees organized in a quincunx as a pleasure for the eyes of a spectator. It means that in ancient Rome, the word quincunx first was already linked to the pattern, and second, this pattern correlated to aesthetic pleasure. Where we can find the earliest evidence for the King Kong's pattern in art. Apparently, it dates even earlier than the first mentioning of this Latin word. The visual origins of the King Kong's composition go back to Etruscan culture, actually. Uh, here on the left, you may recognize the structure with the emphasized center and four lateral elements that dates back to the 5th century BC and originates from Etruscan tomb in Tumzi. I hope I have pronounced uh, it correctly. The next instances of ceiling decorations, such as the composition of now lost vault in nearest almost Aurea, uh, constitute King Kong's composition, and it belongs to the realm of Roman imperial art. And finally, in the second century AD, we have a side of a lead sarcophagus with the cupid in the middle and four personifications in the corner that you can see on the right. Uh, these are the main instances of the King Kongs in pagan context. As you can see, they are very scarce. Regardless, uh, these instances demonstrate at least two things that initially the King Kongs disseminated uh, primarily in Roman context, because apart from Nero's Domus Aurea, there are other evidences of existence of this pattern in um, monumental decorations. And second, uh, it was not related to the cross in this pagan context whatsoever. If it's not related to the cross, then in which circumstances it emerges in the first place, where we can find no statistically accurate data, because in the pagan context, we don't have a lot of the King Kong's patterns. Uh, we can find them in the later Christian examples that continue the tradition of pagan wall decorations in terms of their structure. Um, they might provide us with this answer. King Kong's starts to emerge in the situations where circle combines with a square. The world in the catacombs of Marcellinus and Peter is one of the most illustrative examples of such because, and I'm talking now about the one on the left, it constitutes an elaborate case in which the King Kong's is only a small part of a bigger arrangement and the interplay between a circle and a square is so evident. Here, the King Kongs is created by a rectangular in the compositional canon and by the four roundels attached to its angles. They are needed to smooth the transition from the angular center to a bigger circle. In another cubicle that you can see on the right, uh, it is cubicle from the same catacombs, catacomb, a complex concentric composition fills the ceiling of a square chamber, and in order to mutually harmonize both forms, four additional rounders were added to the corners of the ceiling. However, I would argue that the main reason why the King Kang scheme disseminated so widely from early Christian to early medieval period, and not only in the monumental decorations, but in all kinds of media, was not because it was such a convenient scheme to use on the ceilings of centered edifices, but it was due to its close resemblance to the cross pattern and the dependence on it. In what follows, I will demonstrate this principle using the examples from mosaic pavements, jewelry decorations, uh, coins and book illuminations. For a start, one may look at some of the mosaic pavements in pagan and Christian contexts. 
Both these examples demonstrate the unity of the cross and King Kong's patterns within one composition. However, in the Christian context, the cross starts to prevail. For instance, in the mosaics from Villa Piazza Amarina in Sicily, with the entirely pagan subjects as its theme, namely an erotic scene in the middle accompanied by female personifications, the cross is formed by four hexagons and four half medallions, and the set of other four rounders compose the kinkans. Here, the kinkans and the cross are relatively mm -hmm. equal. But in the 8th century pavement from Jordan, which we've already seen at the beginning of my presentation, all meaning and power is given to the cross, while the king can serves more as a design choice. It comprises a composition with five big medallions designed as a cross, and four smaller and flatter ones between them, uh, which make up an addition and form of the king kings. Another set of artworks for the collation between the King Kongs and the Cross is coins. One can witness the obverse and reverse of an 8th century Anglo-Saxon coin issued in the rule of Kentish King Offa of Mercia. What is interesting is that the center of its reverse incorporates five palettes in a cross form, and the obverse accommodates the King Kongs, which becomes a sort of mirror reflection of the cross. On the right, a copper coin from York demonstrates a similar principle. The cross and king kongs are placed on the reverse and obverse respectively. These two forms become two sides of coin in a very literal sense of the expression. The third group of objects that illustrates the same concept is a large group of inlaid brooches uh, that were circulated in the Anglo-Saxon and Merovingian realms in the fifth 7th centuries AD. The disc brooch of the early 7th century from Kant displays an ornamental cross created by four garnets in a rhombus shape and a king kongs formed by four bosses. The form of a cross which perpetuates dozens of the similar brooches always has this king kongs addition. And the latter is definitely not an autonomous configuration given the Christian context of these treasures. Perhaps an ornamental rhyme of a circle imply the supplementary adornment in order to create a perfect centered structure. And finally, the cross and King Kong's connection, connection is apparent in some of the early medieval manuscript terminations, particularly in the Anglo-Saxon realm. The most important example of such is the Lindisfarne Gospels, where the King Kong's on folio 94 is integral to the form of a cross. A single person named Aldred was responsible for the creation of all the miniatures within the manuscript, and they all were executed as a unit. Thus, the cross on folio 94 is part of a uniform program. Here, by program, we mean corresponding symmetry potentials, the same patterns of compositional con construction. This force, or rather the mastery hand of a talented illuminator, produced five four-page miniatures representing five crosses, including the one on folio 94. And constructing a cross, Andred basically by accident uh, created the King Kong's pattern as well. I hope you can see five medallions here. Uh, perhaps this example, more than all the previous ones, attests to the class correlations of these two forms. And the representational symbolic aspect of the class leads to inevitable suggestion that since the King Kong so often accompanies this important Christian emblem, its wider dissemination from the 4th century AD onward indeed might be directly related to the new status of Christianity. In order to partially redeem the King Kongs from this deep dependence on the cross, we may look at some of the 8th and 9th century examples of Maestas Domini. On one hand, in the Vivian Bible, we encounter an absolute unity of two schemes. Their unity represents the unity of two testaments. 
the prophets placed in the cross pattern and the evangelist in the kinkans and all elements are harmonized by the dominant figure of christ in the middle such a coherence such visual agreement of testaments is particularly important for this manuscript since it contains the whole bible both testaments on the other hand in some instances such as the gandahina's gospels the kinkans forms a completely independent structure. The kinkans and not the cross is used here to accommodate this composition on a rectangular folio. Thus, the independent kinkans scheme is actually, in a way, a cross for rectangular book format. Although the origins of the kinkans form and the cross form are quite different, in the Christian iconography, they became strangely interchangeable because of their eventual formal similarity and the problem the problem of their gradual compatibility is actually very interesting and we can treat it during the discussion so um, as a conclusion i would like to talk a bit more about uh, about the semantic aspect of the king class scheme because so far we were dealing with formal similarity between the cross and the king class patterns to prove their deep congruity. But what are the semantic implications of their resemblance? The King Kongs, as well as Cross, expresses the hierarchy between the center and periphery. And at the same time, the unity and harmony of all the elements within itself, unified by the center. But another sense bearing similarity is based on the significance of the number four for medieval culture, which is so beautifully represented in the four arms of the cross. And we see this significance in Christian iconography in the representations of four evangelists, four cardinal directions, four cardinal winds, four rivers of paradise, four angels at the corners of earth in the apocalypse, and so on and so forth, all of which might be exhibited through both of the forms discussed above. It means that although the origins of both forms are drastically disparate, the visual semblance generated the semblance in meanings. In the years following the Norman Conquest, the 11th century chronicler William of Poitiers wrote an account of the life of William the Conqueror, in which he included a lengthy description of the treasures that William the Conqueror brought back from the newly conquered England to furnish the churches of his home, and noted that the women of the English people are very skilled in needlework and weaving gold thread. That William of Poitiers singled out needlework and in such gendered and racialized terms is consistent with other contemporary sources that not only praise embroideries, but relate their production to the skill of English women. A significant survival of embroidery from this period is of course the biotapestry, the embroidered epic that tells the story of the Norman conquest. However, we may be reasonably sure that the tapestry provides an incomplete picture of the talents of needleworkers in this period. William of Poitiers specifically described the skill of English needlewomen working in gold thread, and the tapestry is made in wool. An earlier survival, the 10th century Cuthbert vestments, survive as evidence of this more glittering tradition, worked as they are entirely in gold and coloured silk threads on a silk background. The vestments are consistent with praise of English women's needlework which predated the conquest. The earliest recorded praise of a needlework in Britain was Thomas of Ely's admiring description of a gold embroidered stolen maniple that St Ethelreda, the abbess of Ely, made, in the made for St Cuthbert in the 7th century and which existed as a continuous tradition into the Opus Anglicanum works of the later medieval period. Embroidery in the 11th and 12th centuries should therefore sit at the apex of our understanding of the development of this great embroidered tradition, and its apparent association in surviving literature with gendered and racialized identities during a time of social and political upheaval around England's conquest suggests that a study of visual art in this period that situates embroidery at the centre of our understanding would prove fruitful. However, embroideries have historically not occupied a prominent position in studies of art of the 11th and 12th century, if indeed they have been included at all. Detailed scholarship of early medieval textiles is often confined to singular studies, 
which emerged first from an interest galvanized by the arts and crafts movement in the 19th century and often authored by those with a background in medieval embroidery, um, as with Grace Christie's 1938 catalogue here, which is still sort of the most um, comprehensive catalogue of English medieval embroidery. The assumption that embroideries were the work of women may be assumed to have contributed to the marginalisation from broader art historical studies, though this is a surprise to no one familiar with Rizika Parker's seminal 1985 text, The Subversive Stitch, in which she outlined, uh, outlined how the exclusion of embroidered works from art history has served as a means of marginalising women's contributions to the art historical canon. This is, however, complicated by uncertainty surrounding the identity of the makers of embroidered works. In no case is the gender of the maker of any surviving embroidery from this period known, and art historical studies which assume them to be the work of women are sometimes so excessively certain as to appear essentialist. In his authoritative study of the biotapestry, David Wilson, Wilson asked, need the tapestry have been made by nuns or even by women? The answer is probably by women, but not necessarily by nuns. And it's worth mentioning that male embroiderers have, albeit extremely rare, mentions in the historical record either side of the 11th and 12th century, in particular the 10th century Bishop St Dunstan. If not all embroideries were necessarily made by women, however, one may instead acknowledge the apparent associations between embroidery and idealised womanhood in this period. As Jane Tibbet Schulenberg has outlined, early medieval praise of women's embroidery skill was often couched in terms of feminine ideals that reinforced gendered behaviours, including chastity, charity and industry. An old English proverb, proverb copied in the 10th century Exeter book stated unequivocally that a woman's place is at her embroidery, and the embroiderers named in the Doomsday book were English women, or to be more specific, those with old English women's names. Gender may therefore remain a useful category of analysis in the study of art of this period, and Judith Butler's understanding of the materialization of gender through a reiteration of norms may be of some import here. To embroider in the 11th and 12th century may have been to act as a mode of performed womanhood, and thus the invocation of embroideries and works of other media may be perceived to have interacted with these gendered identities also. The marginalisation of embroidery, perhaps in part due to the assumed gender of their makers, has however also been compounded by the enduring division drawn between the study of Anglo-Saxon and Norman Romanesque art as distinct and separate art historical styles that lie either side of the Norman conquest. Studies typically concern themselves with one or the other, and any entertainment of interaction between the two is confined to the closing chapter of studies of Anglo-Saxon art or the introduction to studies of the Romanesque. It's a division entrenched by the historical belief that the two opposing styles are the work of two distinct races, the Anglo-Saxon and Norman peoples, and that this ethno-racial difference affected the appearance of their artistic output. David Talbot Rice's 1952 study, for instance, explained the perceived difference between late Anglo-Saxon and early Norman sculptural and architectural styles by the prevalence of Norse blood in one and of Latin blood in the other area. And as late as 1992, George Zarnecki claimed that the Norman people shared a taste for well-balanced hierarchy, visible in both their feudal system and their art. You may also notice um, here in this table of context that textiles is listed by Talbot Rice um, rather unflatteringly as a minor art. Um, the result of such approaches in art historical studies has been a distinctly connoisseurial approach in which such traits as Romanesque tendencies and strong outlines and an Anglo-Saxon love of ornament may be identified. Embroideries, with their continued traditions of working, therefore represent a significant challenge to this ex existing art historical understanding. The Doomsday Book includes those with Old English women's names who worked as embroiderers. William the Conqueror continued to employ the same court embroiderer who had been there before the conquest. And there is evidence of a woman who was granted lands in exchange for teaching the new sheriff of Buckingham's daughters how to embroider in gold. This has thus far received only tangential acknowledgement in art historical scholarship, as a seemingly continuous tradition of embroidery undermines the overriding narrative of historical disruption in this period. An art, an art historical study that looks first to embroideries would thus be well placed to challenge these enduring binaries between the Anglo-Saxon and the Romanesque. The need to reassess our use of these terms has been made especially pressing by the renewed debate surrounding the use of the term Anglo-Saxon in scholarship and the field's association with white nationalist supremacy. What the art historian Catherine Karkov termed recently in her new book as the retrotopia of an imagined purity of the Anglo-Saxon past, propagated by modern nationalist and racist groups. 
Archaeological and literary reassessments of these terms have been ongoing for decades, but art history should sit at the centre of this discourse also, not least because imagery from this period has been and continues to be used for dubious political ends. The Nazi Society for the Study of Germanic Heritage took particular interest in the biotapestry as a work that they considered related to the history of the Aryan race. And Nigel Farage, when questioned about wearing a tie that was printed with imagery from the tapestry whilst canvassing for UKIP in the Rochester by-election in 2014, claimed that it depicted the last time we were invaded and taken over, so it seemed appropriate. A major challenge, however, to situating embroideries at the centre of an art historical study that seeks to disrupt these, these art historical divisions is their relatively poor survival, both in terms that very few survive and those that do are rarely well preserved, as may be clear from these images um, that I took of the 11th century vestments at Worcester Cathedral. And actually, these are the best preserved ones, um, but even they are sort of stuck down and behind glass. Um, and this is only some of them. The rest are actually preserved more like those you can see in the top left hand side of the screen in a box um, and they're sort of loose in the box and when you open the drawer there's bits of sort of loose thread um, lying around and some sort of falling out of frames um, so yeah they're not always terribly well preserved um, there are however art historical means of mitigating against the poor survival of textiles to substantiate their inclusion in broad across medium studies Though 11th and 12th century ekphrastic accounts are referenced in existing studies the potential value of skeuomorphism has I think been overlooked Skeuomorphism, simply put, materials made to look like others, has proved a useful concept in the study of early medieval stone sculpture and allowed speculation as to the extent and direction of transmedial exchange. The image here is a 12th century depiction of the temptation of Adam and Eve painted on the west wall of the chancel at St Baltus Church in Hardham, West Sussex. A part of its design that's often recognised in art historical studies but hasn't really been substantively commented on is that it's painted as though it's a fabric wall hanging suspended by loops on a hooked rail that runs along the top of the wall. Such depictions are significant not only because they may provide a greater impression of what embroideries in this period look like, but also because of the judgment of material value inherent in skeuomorphic exchange. The art historian Megan Bolton defines skeuomorphism as more than mere vestigial traces of earlier technologies, and argued that they instead be considered as invocations of the symbolism inherent within the materials which the object references. It's worth noting that no surviving embroideries are framed within skeuomorphic references to paintings or any other media, and it must be assumed that this detail at St Baltus was a conscious evocation of textiles' social and sacral significance that paintings could only hope to allude to. Such an interpretation may also provide an alternative means of engaging with the role of race and gender more broadly in this period. Bolton's description of skeuomorphs as powerful signifiers of social understandings have been outlined as an alternative to the taxonomical approaches which characterise so many art historical studies of this period. And thus I propose that if the mediums that were skeuomorphically invoked may be determined to have had clear cultural associations with certain gendered or racialised identities, as embroideries were with English women, then the cultural import of these identities within the Anglo-Norman cultural paradigm may be assessed without resorting to the identification of essentialized traits. Considered within the historical evidence for the position of English women in this period, this visual evidence becomes yet more compelling. That the incoming Norman ruling class sought to strengthen their hereditary claims to the land they acquired after the conquest through marriage to elite English women has been recognized, and subsequent genealogies of English kings often reference their matrilineal Saxon side. It could be argued that the continued patronage of and clear reference to the perceived value of embroideries in works of other media, like the conscious intermarriage of Norman lords to English women, was a purposeful cultivation of the in insular woman, as what the post-colonial cultural theorist Homi Baba may have recognised as such a performance of difference that he deemed essential in the construction of cultural hybridities that emerge in moments of historical transformation. In the case of the paintings at St Boltoff's, it is a particularly valuable approach. The painted schemes are part of the so-called Lewis group of wall paintings, which consist of those in the churches in Clayton, Westmeston, Coombs, Plumpton and Hardham in Sussex, all believed to date from the late 11th or early 12th century. The treatment of these paintings in existing art historical scholarship typify the connoisseurial and essentialist tones that have limited the study of art in this period. Dating to the period after the conquest, they are often examined for either Anglo-Saxon or Norman traits, as a means of assessing the long-held belief that the paintings were the work of the same school of continental craftsmen employed by the Cluniac Priory founded in Lewis 
in 1081 by the first Norman, Earl of Surrey. It is an approach typified here by the art historian Charles Dodwell. Of course, if the Norman artist had settled in England, he could be considered to be Anglo-Norman. Such a description reveals the instability of these racialized terms so frequently applied to art historical studies, as race is seemingly dictated by one's place of origin, place of work, associated cultural centers, and is visible in one's artistic output. Race in this period may indeed have been this complex and changeable, but to assert that such nuance is visible in the stylistic depiction of the human form with little historical corroborative evidence is to resort to an essentialist understanding of artistic practice. Geraldine Heng, in her recent study, The Invention of Race in the Middle Ages, argued that race in the medieval period may be best understood as a structural relationship that managed human difference, and which in the absence of clear physiognomic differences may have been signaled through a series of cultural cues. In the context outlined in historical sources, skeuomorphic references to the textiles associated with English women's work may be understood as such a cultural cue, which both elevated the position of embroideries in material culture and affirmed the significance of their makers as gendered and racialized identity in the production of an Anglo-Norman culture. And thus, even if, as Dodwell claimed, elements of the paintings were purely Norman, the invocation of a material form which was so extensively associated with insular women gives a greater sense of cultural hybridity than has previously been entertained. Further evidence that painters of this period, and those of the Lewis group in particular, sought to consciously invoke the materiality of textiles in their work is also visible in the explicitly skeuomorphic depictions of simple hanging drapes, as here at a break in the wooden dado panelling on the north wall of the nave at St. Altus. Three successive painted drapes are visible, the muted grey colour of which renders them distinct from the rest of the red and ochre paint that characterises the rest of the scheme. Far from being unique, painted fictive draperies appear to have been a relatively common feature of 12th century wall paintings, as pictured here in the churches of St Mary's in West Chitlington and the church at Quarhampton. In addition to affirming the value of the materials on which these embroideries were worked, the relative uniformity of representation of these drapes across media also confirms the extent of transmedial exchange in this period. This is confirmed again by the exaggerated drapes on the reliquaries on a pivotal scene in the tapestry. I apologize here for the page join in this image. Um, every book of, that has a reproduction of the Bayeux tapestry, this image is across a page join. Um, as a textile represented on a textile, it is an especially compelling example as it represents not only the object depicted, but also a skeuomorphic tradition of representation, which affirms the material significance of the very material on which it is displayed. Moreover, this shared imagery invites one to consider the potential for transmedial exchange between embroideries and wall paintings more broadly, and to expand Bolton's understanding of skeuomorphism further. This is consistent with other contemporary embroideries of this period, including those on the Bayeux Tapestry and those illustrated here from the V&A's collection, in which similar stylization and framing devices convey a sense of vitality and character rather than the pursuit of idealism and realism. Though I'm limited in time today to expand this visual analysis more persuasively, I nevertheless hope that I've demonstrated that there was a greater degree of stylistic consistency between wall paintings and embroideries in this period than has previously been recognised. Though it remains to ask what, if any, conclusions may be drawn from such observations about the role of the identity of the English woman associated with the creation of embroideries. It may at least be claimed that embroideries were far from the minor art that Talbot Rice categorised them as, and that their makers were by no means disengaged from the stylistic developments of the day. However, however further conclusions about quasi-skeuomorphism and the potential centrality of these embroideries in the apparently increasingly hybrid material culture would require one to prove the direction of transmedial exchange, to identify an instance in which paintings appear to have looked to textiles and repeated their imagery. A close reading of a particular element, in this case a representation of armoured male, may I believe provide some evidence for this direction of transmedial exchange from embroideries to wall paintings. I don't have much time to explain this next bit that I've been working on, but I've been looking at depictions of mail across media, starting with the simple crosshatch brush strokes in this painting at Pyford in Surrey, and how that looks so much like the crosshatch type E embroidered stitches representing mail on the Bayeux tapestry. 
My argument is essentially that because of the material affinity between male and textile construction, which is attested to particularly in riddling literary sources, what Cavell, Megan Cavell describes as the cloth material nexus, but also in some material evidence, this is a recreation um, by Lester Macon of some metalwork embroidery based on some found in a cremation grave in Ingleby in Derbyshire. Such material affinities and cultural links seemingly left embroiderers free to construct their own metaphoric means of depicting male, the cross hatching that was then apparently repeated in other mediums, not just paintings, but also here on the 11th century sculpted Winchester frieze, in which alternating raised and depressed squares, bear no de which bear no depiction to actual male, but do look like the cross hatched male on the tapestry. Such observations confirm that the direction of transmedial exchange operated from embroideries to paintings, an observation rendered unsurprising by the more explicit skeuomorphic references to textiles in which these details, and more paintings more broadly in this period, appear often to have been framed. And the afore discussed historical evidence for the respective position of embroiderers in early medieval material culture makes this entirely unsurprising. This assessment is additionally consistent with the impression given by historical evidence that English women were considered loci of insularity and thus possess significant cultural capital in the developing Anglo-Norman cultural construction. Gender and race in this period, as in our own, remain complex, at times impenetrable categories, and it is challenging to map them onto surviving visual evidence when no details about their makers survive. And going forward in my PhD project, I will continue to be guided by these questions about how to best engage with these categories. Nevertheless, I hope that the, quest that the conclusions drawn today may have outlined an alternative approach. Instead of speculating as to whether makers of certain works were Anglo-Saxon or Norman, it may instead be concluded that their skeuomorphic and quasi-skeuomorphic references to textiles would have been understood by their original audience to sustain the English embroidering woman as a pillar of the Anglo-Norman cultural construction after the conquest. Such conclusions significantly complicate existing art historical binaries between Anglo-Saxon and Romanesque art and point to the significance of an identity and medium so often marginalised in art historical study. Thank you very much.